Welcome, everybody, and thank you once again for joining TLC Presents Conversations. We are so thrilled that you're here with us today. We're excited about who we have. Please wave everybody from home and in your cars to Louise and Chris from Viva Tierra. They're joining us today to chat a little bit about Viva Tierra and what they do. Viva Tierra is a sales and marketing agency that represents farmers from around the globe. In addition, they also own their own farms and cold storage down in Chile. So joining us today is my friend Chris Ford. Chris Ford is the business development and marketing manager for Viva Organic. Uh, he started his natural foods career a long time ago, gray hairs like me ago, with Alfalfa's Market in Colorado, and later, of course, became Wild Oats. He's been a part of several great organizations in his career before he's, his path led him to Viva Tierra. They include Earthbound Farms in a purchasing and planning role. He was global produce and floral purchasing team leader for Whole Foods Market, the vice president at Sutherland Produce. He spent some time as an organic and food service category manager with the Oppenheimer Group as well. Chris, welcome and thanks for being here. Thank also you, joining us is Luisa Cunha, president and CEO of Viva Tierra. Um, Luis and I have known each other a long time and this is really special for me to have him here. But Luis came to the United States as a teenager. Uh, he came here as a foreign exchange student back in 1983 and landed in the beautiful state of Washington. After high school, he went back home for a few years and then came back to the States and went to school and finished college up at the University of Washington, go Huskies. Um, Luis began his journey in the organic world uh, back in 1992 with a very old classic name that a lot of people hopefully remember and that's Cascadian Farms. Um, in 1993, the Viva Tierra organic brand was launched and moving forward from that in 2013, Cascadian Fr uh, Fresh turned into Viva Tierra Organics uh, as an opportunity to help better represent their mission and values to their customers. Uh, Luis is truly an industry pioneer. Um, you can't be around as long as he and I have, especially as long as he have, and not be considered a pioneer in some ways. Um, but he also, one of the things I think is really interesting that probably people don't know is that he helped to launch the very first organic pear and apple import program into the United States um, from, the or from the Argentinian Patagonia. And that's pretty, it's pretty special to have by your name. Um, so 30 years later, Luis has continued to contribute to the growth of the industry by working with domestic and international organic farmers. Luis and his team, Chris, has been supporting family farms in Central America by helping to get their organic product and their ideas off the ground and providing market access for them here in the United States. And I will personally say that I feel Luis is one of the most humble men I've ever met. And uh, to add on to that statement a little bit, I know I'm probably embarrassing him, but I don't care. To add on to that statement, as he so eloquently put to me in a note, he said, the, and I quote, the personal rewards and growth of all these experiences cannot be described with simple words. And I think that's a very special statement. So help me, everybody, in our 350 million, billion, excuse me, billion now, global galactic audience in welcoming Chris and Louise to Toddversations. Thanks, guys, for joining me. Thank you, Todd. Thank so you, let's Todd. dive in. Thank you. Let's dive in. Um, Luis, tell us a bit of the history of Viva Tierra. Give us the background. Tell us what we don't know. Wow. You know, it's, um, it seems to me like it happened just yesterday, really. Um, back in 1992, I met Roger and Jean uh, here in the Skagit Valley. So Roger Wexler and Jean Kahn. Yeah, yeah. Roger yeah. Wexler and Jean Kahn. You know, Jean was the founder of Cascadian Farm and and Roger and Jean had joined forces. Um, and, uh, and then I just came along a couple of years, a few years later. And um, mm -hmm. so I started working in the Rockport concrete area with them and the entire Cascadian farm team, which was phenomenal, um, really committed to organics. So I really got immersed into that passion and, and the drive that these uh, folks had. And, um, you know, kind of the the hippie flair to it too. If you are about to it, it was don't just, talk about our past. We, it was just wonderful, and uh, you know, my plan was to go back to UW and you know get a a degree, you know, in uh, a law degree maybe, and per pursue that career maybe be right. a lawyer or something like that, or go back to Chile and be a diplomat or something. I was like, you know, thinking that my life was going to go a different way, but. I landed at Cascadian Farm and the rest of the history, really. It, it was just uh, a wonderful experience working with Gene and Roger. They were my mentors in the industry. And so I felt very privileged to work alongside with them. Uh, and, and they really um, inspired me 
uh, to keep going. And that's how I, then I, I was, uh, you know, I had the, the courage to run for the OTA board. And, okay. and then we were on the OTA board too. Sure, yeah. We served together. That was, that was fun. But that was fun. That was fun yes. serving the industry. It's fun. You know, it's fun to give yes. of yourself. And I think when I think about Viva Tierra, I think that's a lot of what you guys do is you give of yourself above and beyond just the transactional nature of produce. And I want to lean into that statement a little bit and talk about your organic to the core campaign, because I don't necessarily know how many people know if they've not heard about this. I think it's so worthwhile and what you're trying to accomplish. And so can you share a little bit about, you know, where that idea came from and what it means to you? Yeah, um, organic to the core, um, it, it came, you know, was born as of a, an idea to reinforce the roots of our company. Because, you know, Roger started on his own back in 1984. Then he joined mm -hmm. uh, forces with Gene Kahn at Cascade and Farm. Then mm -hmm. I came along in 92. And then we both said, let's move on to bigger and better things. So we started this program from South America. And, and the company has evolved and we work with so many family farmers, you know, small farmers. So um, a few years back, you know, like three or four years ago, we just said, you know what, uh, let's come up with a motto that will represent the company. And that's how Organic to the Core came about. And I'm very proud of that. And I really, and, and, and you know, we have been offered opportunities to, to merge with other conventional growers and everything. No, we want to be Organic to the Core. Um, and and really thrive on on that passion. That's fantastic. So, how how does that translate back? You know, you're starting this and 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 extremely commendable, what what you're doing and why you're doing it. And you know, I say all the time that organics is a morals and values decision for people, right? Some way it connects to them. And I love the fact that you're raising the bar of connectivity to your company to your brands by putting your mission and your values on your sleeve. I commend you for that. So what does organic to the core mean to your farmers? How are they embraced that? Uh, they um, are quite excited actually um, to, because it represents them as well, you know, to be part sure. of, the, of, of the program. Uh, most of them, um, I'm not gonna say all of them, but a lot of them, have been in organics for a long time to themselves. For example, one of our growers in, in Argentina is still with us today after 30 years. So wow. that's what it really means, you know, and we uh, along the way are enlisted new family growers who, you know, also feel identified with the, with the slogan, with the motto of organic to the core. So, so it's really about elevating the organic conversation through your company. It's about standing behind the fact that that seal, that process, those standards are the benchmark that you drive forward with in every direction. Exactly. Yeah, I love the exactly. way that translates I mean, down and I can see where the growers would, yeah. Go ahead. And, and, and Todd, I, Todd, I would add that, um, you know, it is a campaign for us to, to really take that, you know, tagline and mm -hmm. which has been, you know, at the heart in the core of the company, you know, for, since its inception, yeah, like nine, um, yeah. to bring it to the trade more and, and celebrate those small family farmers that we represent all over the world. You know, it's, sure. it's, a, it's quite a shared partnership. And to me personally, the organic to the core, it means in every process, it means, you know, people, planet, product. And, right. you know, as, as a, an importer representing um, these growers that don't necessarily have a voice sometimes, you know, we're, we're you know, like Luis had mentioned, uh, you know, one of our longest suppliers in Argentina, you know, we're providing a platform for their community, um, for work and, you know, growth. And it's an exciting um, to the diversity of different growers we work with around the world in different countries. It's, mm -hmm. it's very fulfilling to be able to be able to tell their story and bring their products to market. And so that's what we're hoping to convey in that message a little bit more to the trade. In, I love that. So, in the coming up. so to lean back into that and, and directly to you, Chris, on the question. So what do you want uh, your customers to know about this? What do you want your customers to embrace? I mean, obviously the concept is it's, it's a no brainer to go, Oh yeah, I get that. That's I'm on board with that. But I mean, so what, what do you want the customers to know? Well, I think the big thing is our model is, is um, you know, although a, a big core of our business is organic apples and pears, 
and sure. we do offer them year round. Our model is quite different than you know most uh, that are North American based companies that mm -hmm. grow a crop, harvest it, put it in storage and sell it year round. And while there's nothing wrong with that, um, you know, our model is different where we're constantly moving geographies. So it gives us a kind of broader scale of, of growers that we represent. Sure. And sure. for me, it's about focusing on freshness and flavor, you know, year round. And it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a unique model and uh, it, it's been very successful for us. And, you know, it's gonna continue to, you know, it, in other categories, we essentially do the same thing, whether it be, you know, we're not necessarily known for onions, but, you know, right. Bigotiera has been uh, in the organic onion business for two decades, year round right. production right. for kiwi from Italy. So I think part of it is, is um, also expanding the messaging and letting our customers know that we're more than just apples and pears too. Right. I think that's, I think it's great. I, I love it. You know, Luis, in, in your bio, I talked a little bit about how you're supporting farms and you touched on it a little bit already. And, and I just want to get right straight to the question because I think it's such, it's such an amazing part about our industry and the food industry as a whole is that it has such an opportunity to uplift people. It has such an opportunity to change things. You know, food is medicine, food is a drug, food is a lot of right. things. And it's a super important part of everybody's existence. So what are you doing to kind of support and work with the lives down, you know, with your growers beyond just selling their food? Can you touch on that a little bit? Yes, um, it's a actually a very important question, very good question, uh, because well, we things try. happen. We try to think things through. I mean, I could ask yeah. you a dog's name, but that is just not going to play long. <laughs> right. No, honestly, I mean, things have happened throughout the years in our lives, you know, like, I, I can recall when we were working back in, in, in Honduras um, in the early 2000s, Hurricane Mitch, that really um, devastated the area and the country um, in the growing areas where we were working with our growers. So um, that's just one example, but along the way throughout the years, we have supported many causes we give to nonprofit organizations, like around Christmas times, instead of sending packages of goodies to customers, we just kind of uh, have set a budget aside to donate to different organizations locally and internationally um, that really go out and help people in, in times of need. And uh, no, no. so but I, it would be a long list, honestly, like the last time that um, I looked at it, it was more like 80 organizations that we support, you know, as best as we can through, throughout the years to, uh, you know, I mean, be there that's, for people and, and farmers, even for even with our own industry to, you know, when there is a, a need to there's a fundraiser or something. We, we're part of it. That's amazing. Well, you know what? It's organic to the core, right? It's, <laughs> it's right, organic baby. to the core. It's organic to the core. I and not that. that I'm the host, but I'm going to ask a question um, to segue. Uh, it, I think, um, Luis, also the um, the cooperative that we're members of and growers and part of. I think yeah. that's, you know, you can well, speak to it. Um, really I was going to ask about the soccer. I was going to ask about soccer too. I beat you to it. <laughs> you got me. I'm out. I'm going to go. It's beer time. See ya. <laughs> but Luis, I think yes. the cooperative is very unique. Again, that yeah. what makes our model sure. unique and it's, it's, it's For sure. an incredible yeah. benefit to the community. Yes, we became founding members through our farming Chile, uh, this new organic producer co-op of Chile. And it, it's uh, right now it's only five members. Uh, it was um, actually uh, founded last November in uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. So it's it just getting undergoing, but it seems like a collaboration and, and cooperation among farmers is the key to the future, to the success of the future. So, um, and also it's going to be a, the driving, you know, mechanism to open up new markets and provide business opportunities, new business opportunities for uh, an array of uh, products that these growers uh, produce down there. I think that's fantastic. I really do. I think that's great. So what, real quick, soccer, soccer story. You guys had a, you guys had your own Sunday soccer league and now it's blown up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually um, I've been invited to play quite a few times, but the workers now in the, in the, at the farm, they beat me anymore. I, I, I can't keep up with it. A lot of young Rolls. kids, lots of young kids, honestly, such talent. Um, and, but you know, it's fun. It, it brings the community together. 
sure. and it keeps youngsters out of trouble. I mean, there's so many good things that happen with this type of programs. It's part of being um, of, in, in, involved in the community. I, w- I want to shift gears a little bit from you working with growers and talk a little bit about you as the grower, because I think that it, it, it's, you become so much more connected to your growers by being in that same, at times, boat with the hole in it or the boat that's a little rocky, you know, you're dealing with all these things. And I think it puts things in perspective with you. So you are more than an importer. You're also gross. So share with us, can you a little bit about your farm? Thank you for the question. Um, It's important from the standpoint that, um, you know, we understand the the struggles, the challenges, you know, uh, that local producers go through. Mm-hmm. And, and also, it gives us um, credibility when, you know, with, with the farming community. Because when we say, hey, the market is, is tough, the market is tough. Sometimes I say, hey, the market is really good. We're going to have good opportunities to place your fruit, to get a good price for it. They just keep on with the steady, you know, quality, mm-hmm. and, and we're going to be okay. And, and I believe that um, level of trust that comes along with being a peer um, it, it's, it, it's invaluable. And, For sure. and from that standpoint, uh, I feel like I'm part of the community as well. I'm not just um, collecting a, you know, a, a commission. It's more than that. And, and we stick our neck out for the growers. And when we need to support, when times are tough, we go in, we support a little bit the returns. But the main thing for us is to keep the growers in business. You know? right. And, and they, they sense that and they see that. Mm-hmm. You know, and then when the times are good, we all share in the reward in a fair way as well. So it's about treating each other fairly. Hey, organic to the core, being right? Being transparent. And I, I, I would wanna... add to that too, being a, being a grower specifically in the Southern Hemisphere and being part of a cooperative with other growers, um, you know, North America is one destination for the product, but there's also, it's a global market. And sure. so it, you know, it fluctuates with, you know, uh, obviously every year, depending on the crops in different countries, the currency values, the freight values. So, you know, the, it gives us a really global perspective on what's going out there in the markets that not only we represent sales for here in North America, but globally, because, you know, our, some of our fruit from our own farm or you know, within the cooperative certainly goes uh, to different markets based on the need on an annual basis. Sure. Well, I mean, and I think you can speak to this better than most because you've got skin in the game. You're playing in that arena. So what's one of the biggest challenges that you're facing today as a grower? Climate change is one of them. Um, you know, uh, we've been involved in, in, the, in the farming business for, over, you know, uh, in Chile with apples over 20 years. And, and I have to say that we've seen, you know, in that, in southern Chile, you know, it's in right. Chiang, the town is Chiang area, but I think um, we see climate change affecting the, you know, the crops, not only fruit, but all kinds of crops in, in their area. And, and here in North America, in Washington state, the same sure. way. I mean, you know, uh, we get freezes more often, or sometimes it's just, you know, really hot. This, uh, you know, it's a huge fluctuation in temperatures and and sometimes you think you're going in the right direction and the weather is cooperating with you and then all of a sudden it just boom. That's um, well. A weather event can can you know really um, cause commercial damage to your fruit. Absolutely. Well, I mean, think about it. You've got you know you've got snow in Houston this year. You've got all kinds of problems. Water, right. California, worse right. worse water conditions. 125 right. years, I believe, is what the number is now. I mean, it's you know it's right. just a matter of time before lawns are dried up. Things are drastically going to change. And you're right. Climate is a huge issue, and climate affects a multiplicity of things in the food sector. And I think people need to recognize that water is a part of that ecosystem. Soil is a part of that ecosystem. Clouds are a part of that ecosystem. All of it kind of needs to come together. And and of course, finding solutions to climate change Mm -hmm. is something I think that requires a big group of people with all kinds of good ideas to come together and chart a path for further success. And I think the ag community, I hope embraces that and comes together in unity uh, to talk about it. That's very important. We, we need to do that for sure. Yeah. 
Um, I know you just built a new facility down in Chile. And I, the reason I bring this up is that I think it's super cool what you've done and why you've done it and some of the neat things, the way you've landscaped the place and why you've landscaped it. Can you share with us a little bit about how you've driven climate thought, the climate thought process or, you know, climate change thought process into your architecture and what you built down there? Yes, uh, the concept came about protecting our investment. You know, we are, you know, providing financial support to grow these crops for nine months of the year. And in the end, um, we, need, we need our own home to, to protect that investment um, in case, you know, there's other related issues, you know, that sure. don't have anything to do with climate change, but sure. social unrest or, you know, strikes or, you know, uh, port stoppages. And um, especially this year, you know, it, it's been really critical to have that infrastructure because we want to store our fruit and preserve the quality of our fruit, you know, for us, in, in, you know, for as long as we can until mm -hmm. we're ready to bring it to market. And or or ship it to Europe, whatever the market might be. It's not only 100% mm -hmm. North America. Mm -hmm. So that was really the, the driving um, factor for the decision. And and also at the same time, we are strategically located and are able to provide cold storage services for our other growers' uh, fruit. And mm -hmm. um, because capacity is really uh, in short supply right now. Sure. Sure. Tell me about the building. Tell me about what you did from an architectural standpoint, though. I mean, oh, talk to me about the, the ivy up the side of the wall. I give, <laughs> I I mean, give I think all the credit to the professionals. You know, well, take, the, hey, the architects, hey, know they, they design an environmentally friendly building. Um, the, the way they positioned the building, it, it, was, it was very well thought out. And, and they wanted to, of course, bring in um, the the protection through and, and try to uh, conserve energy. That was one of the, you know, the main um, right. factors here. And so you insulate energy. the outside of the building with plants. Yeah, insulate the outside of the building with, um, uh, what do you call it? The, I, it's ivy, yeah, Boston ivy. ivy, ivy yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, and that's so to, to keep things cold. So basically the sun, you know, to shield off the, the heat, the, the heat sure. from the sun. And um, so, and then the, the last step that we still, you know, we're trying to get to the, the last step of it would be solar panels to uh, install solar panels. It's unbelievable. I mean, I, you know, you think about it and you, you know, and it's interesting because we talk about climate change, water, all these different things, but then something so simple as the way you position the building going north, south, something so simple as how you put Mm -hmm. plants around the outside of the building to protect it from the sun as mm -hmm. an insulation barrier that is also a positive climate change move. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. Yeah, I think it's, it's something so simple. that uh, it's so exactly I was leading up to it's so simple. Hey, it's organic to the core, right? <laughs> you got it. I gotta stop yeah. saying it eventually. I promise. <laughs> I no, promise. No, no, keep it saying it. We love it. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah. I think it's awesome. So you guys, you know, I want to kind of come back a little bit because I don't necessarily know if everybody that's listening out there fully understands what it's like to try to work offshore and bring product into the United States and kind of that whole puzzle of importing commodities. And so can you share a little bit about how you go about importing commodities, the whole, the, the big logistical puzzle that's involved um, and things that you've done to kind of solve it? I know it's a big, broad question, but I'm really kind of focusing on like the process that you guys demonstrate back to your farmers about what you do. Chris, you want to either one of you don't fight for the hey, don't fight. Well, I'll make I, up an I answer talk, if you guys I, don't I have. Mean, I, I can speak to some of the at least some of the challenges you know that we've experienced this year. Sure. And um, you know, they are ever present on an annual basis, but COVID has certainly impacted the supply chain in many ways. And you know, uh, as being a you know bringing product into both coasts, you know, everyone there are a lot of people are aware of it that back up in Long Beach. Um, you know, this past uh, spring and winter has had a huge impact. Um, and so, you know, things like having to bring more fruit to the East Coast and find other solutions to get it West, um, the increase. So you shifted, so you shifted your model. So you're saying, hey, I got 10 boxes and you go to the West Coast, but because Long Beach is so jacked up, 
we're having to repivot and put something into Philadelphia now that we didn't intend to. We did initially, yes. And yeah. so what we're, you know, we're, you know, it's also um, strategic in the fact that, you know, if we're bringing apples and pears in to the east, there's, there's a, certainly a freight advantage, which again, another COVID impacted piece is, you know, just the availability of drivers and freight costs east to west, incredible astronomical you know, inflation, you know, compared to last year. So we give our customers an advantage by, you know, it could be upwards of $10 a box for a box of apples to go from Washington state to the East coast. So have you, have you ever heard truck prices as high as what I'm hearing out there today? I mean, not it's this consistently. I mean, it's I, almost you know, a house down payment. There's been historical, you know, like little spikes here and there around Christmas tree season or that kind of thing, but sure. you know, not for this prolonged of a period. Right. But so it's a, it's in a big impact. So not only Overland freight, but then, you know, um, you know, just availability of equipment, at the piers, you know, whether it be, you know, chassis or, you know, uh, employees affected by COVID, you know, at the ports, um, delaying uh, process through, you know, just mm -hmm. getting it through the port system. So it's been a myriad of things um, this year that have, mm -hmm. that, it, that have added some yeah. complexity. And well, I've heard, sure. Well, I've heard some more stories about boats just being parked for two, three weeks, just waiting to get unloaded. And then, you know, right. you, you unload your container. You're just, you've just got juice coming out. Have you guys, did you run into any of that or? Well, fortunately, you know, most of our product that we bring is hard of is hardware items. Um, we so, did, but yeah. you know, we did have um, some challenges and again, uh, earlier in the season was some soft fruit. And part of the challenge was again, not we're, we're shutting off half of our customer base on the West coast and having it diverted to the East coast. So right. it somewhat limits your sales as well. Um, sure. By not, by not having that um, option too. So, well, and it's it, not it, as, but we're flexible. I mean, we've been looking at, you know, we've been proactive in finding solutions for our customers. Well, you, it's, and our, so, and our growers. so Taking that comment, you know, being proactive, Luis, I want to kind of come back to you on the, the first part of this question about how you're working yeah. with your growers, mm -hmm. you know, because it's real yeah. easy to say, hey, I'll go yeah. sell your stuff, blah, blah, blah. But you have right. such a different commitment level. And, it, and, and, and I, I know how a lot of that works just off of my own experience out in the world. But, you know, you put effort into helping growers before they even put a box in, a, you know, or, or pack a box of apples or pears. You're committed to them in a financial way, you're committed to them in a strategic way. And I don't think people understand the connectivity that's involved right. um, in, yeah. in that importing process like that. Right, and, and it's all about, like I said before, cooperation, type communication and expertise. You know, we bring a level of expertise and professionalism to the relationship that they, you know, from let's say packing instructions um, and uh, for them to be able to pack the correct grades to start with and the sizes of the fruit that we need and everything in order to, to, to bring it to market. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure in, in South America, in Argentina and in Chile especially, uh, it's set up for exports. So we can count on maintaining the cold chain and preserving the quality and the, and the fruit um, in good condition throughout the trip, throughout the journey. Um, the service industry, um, like um, customs brokers and freight forwarders and mm -hmm. steamship lines, uh, it, it's, it's all integrated in a nice way to, to make it possible. Right. So, I mean, so you guys, you know, obviously take and do a lot of the heavy lifting. I mean, obviously the grower does the, the you know, the lifting to get yes. it into your box. But after that, I think, you know, I think it's great that we had this kind of conversation around logistics of it, because I just don't think, I'm sure the consumer doesn't realize what's involved with getting your apple to their store in Phoenix, right? And the steps that have to be taken, right? They just want that red apple there. But I think it's right. good that people recognize that there is so much connectivity. There's so much risk involved. There's so much preparation involved. Um, so taking that thought process one step farther, you know, with the logistics that are involved and so how do you balance the needs of the market with the needs of your growers in that situation? Because you could be putting something on the water and, and I'm guessing, let's say it's 21 days to, to, to boat it up. I'm, mm -hmm. I don't even know if that's right, but let's say yeah. 21, um, you know, the market may be I, this 
this and then it's that. And how do you balance? How do you, you know, because that's, there's nothing worse than getting a grower mad because he thinks it should be this when it's not, right? I can't tell you the number of times I've heard that before, right? right? And I'm sure you have too. So how do you balance that and keep them satisfied? Good question. Let me give you some background. Really Thank you. Question. We're trying. We're um, trying to make good ones here. I'm trying, baby. I'm trying hard. So by really by um, being in a unique pos position to educate the grower and our customers at the same time, because we see both sides. You know, right. we see the production side, we see the market side. So basically, um, we, on the one hand, we educate the grower about the market. We need to give them information. And one of the things that have helped us in that effort is that along the years, we have hosted growers from South America here in North America, in Washington State, we've toured them around, and vice versa. We have mm -hmm. brought growers from Washington State down to South America so they can see the reality, so they can have a peer-to-peer -peer conversation about challenges, issues, and rewards. Rewards of being in the business. So, you know, I believe that we're uh, bridging the gap, you know, that has existed for so many years. And, and it's part of the transparency, it's part of being organic to the core. You know, that Love it. we want people to meet, we want people to talk, to engage in conversation. So, because the more knowledge that we bring to them, the better they will understand of what needs to be done and the investments that they need to make in order to be competitive in the marketplace. Because the ultimate goal is to bring consumers the best eating experience, the most flavorful fruit that they can eat, whether it's from our own state here in Washington state, from California, uh, Oregon, from all the growing regions that we have, that we bring mm -hmm. them the best uh, tasting food possible. A great answer, and I could see I could see why you've been doing what you've been doing for so long, and why you continue to have new people calling and talking to you. Because I think that you have provided a runway of transparency and honesty and openness yeah. that, to me, is uplifting. Right? I think that's what it's about. This isn't a yeah. transactional business, right? I, I I I say it all the time. When you put people in front of POs, good things happen, right? And it's no different. I I see you guys living that every day, and it's it's commendable. It's commendable. And if, and if I told you all the fun that we've had along the way on these trips, you would be jealous. So I wouldn't even go there. <laughs> well, thanks for calling. I'm available. Let me know. I'll go with you. I'll go right with on. you. So, you know, one of the fun things about doing this is, you know, obviously uh, roping you into spending some time with me uh, chatting up stuff. But I get to ask some fun questions back and forth with you guys. And, and I and I. I kind of ask everybody this, the same kind of question because it's kind of fun. I've got some great answers. I've got some very inspirational answers too. And so um, each one of you, of the two questions, you each answered them so differently. One of you is getting one of them, the other one's getting another. So I'm going to throw this one out really quick to you first, Louise. And I, and I, and I, cause I know the answer, but I, I loved your answer. And I just want, I want everybody to hear it because I think it's so worthy. Share with us inspirational people for you and, and, and why you chose them as your inspirations. Yes, uh, for me, as I say, it was uh, Roger Wexler and, and Jean Kahn because they, again, they were my mentors. I respected them a great deal. Um, they, they did so much, you know, for the organic community, for the organic movement back then. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe they laid the foundation for a grassroots um, market, you know, that the, the market was built by people really committed to having a different, healthier type of food and, and also uh, preserving, you know, the environment and, and supporting, you know, putting their dollars, voting with their dollars to support an agriculture that mm -hmm. was, you know, um, in, in, in more harmony with nature, you know, and, uh, and I think that's, that's why I, I was very, again, um, privileged to have worked alongside with these pioneers and uh, I learned a lot from them. And then other people that, you know, I met throughout, you know, the years in the industry also, it, it's just been a wonderful experience, but they are uh, the, the people that come to mind for me. You know, and if, if in being that I've been around a while myself, I will say that Gene and Roger both were inspirational to me. Roger, especially, mm -hmm. I thought he was really, really something. And I learned a lot from him. I was very young back then. Um, very young. Now I'm very old. Um, but I learned a lot from those guys. And that's why I wanted to lean back into that. Cause I agree with you. I think they were really great. And if, and if you don't know who those guys are, I would suggest taking a minute to mm -hmm. Google and see what they've done and who they were, because they really they, were, they, they blazed a trail. Yes, they deserve some acknowledgement. And um, I still see Roger 
He, Let's get him he on. Farms, he farms. Get him on. Yeah, uh, near near our office here in in the Skagit Valley. So he's a farmer and he's involved in it. He's engaged. He's still passionate about organics. So I love it. Yeah, I love it. All right, Chris. Now it's your turn. One of the other questions that I ask people is is to share something uh, about yourself that nobody knows about you. And I've seen some pretty good answers, but I got to tell you, right now you are in first, second, and third place at this point until somebody dethrones you, which if they do dethrone you, I will let you know. But right now you are in the lead. Share your story, Chris, that nobody's going to know about you. All right. Well, I almost died in an avalanche. And so this is back in the 90s. And I was working at alfalfas and wild oats. And uh, in fact, it's where I met you both back in the day from on the purchasing side. With, and, hey, Louise, when they say back in the day, that's also when they say you are old now. That's what that means. I've realized hey, it back I was, in the day. I was there I, back in the day, too. Yeah, we, were, there, yeah, so. we were sitting on the Davenport back then. <laughs> yeah. And we used to, we used to um, you know, the, 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 at retail, they would love for me to work during the weekends because it was busy. So my typical schedule was I was off Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So anyway, long story short, every, every Monday afternoon, we'd head to the mountains and uh, it was in the winter. I'd like to spend a lot of time in the snow and doing things. So went uh, with snowshoeing with a couple of buddies of mine up in Rocky Mountain National Park. And I was leading out this traverse. And I knew a fair amount about avalanches and, you know, to be prepared. And um, anyway, I was walking across, uh, which is a, um, a waterfall in the summertime. And all of a sudden, I remember just, I'll never forget this terrible sound. It was just like this really low, like, and all of a sudden I knew my feet were out from underneath of me and I was tumbling down the hill. And um, my one buddy who was on the side of the avalanche, he didn't get caught up into it because kind of buried to his waist. And I was wearing a red jacket. He said he would see me disappear under the snow and come back up and disappear again. And anyway, at the bottom, yeah, at the bottom, I fell about 800 tumbling. feet down this. I just instinctively swam. I don't know why, I, I mean, that was just my instinct. And, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to die in an avalanche. And anyway, I got to the bottom and fortunately I was like facing upwards and I pushed the snow out from off of my head and popped this plug of ice out of my throat. I thought I was going to have a heart attack because my heart was racing a million miles an hour, but that was a crazy day. And I, I really, it, 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 I walked away from that thinking, man, I'm not as uh, invincible as I think I am at 25, 26 years old or whatever. And, uh, I, and I never told my mom until like 10 years later. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> well, what else are you holding back from her? You want to get that uh, off your chest now too? We'll that, listen. That's another, no? that's another Todd Versations for the future. <laughs> we'll do that one over a couple of beers. Yeah, absolutely. So, anyway. so <laughs> that's an amazing story. Like I said, you're in first and second, third place probably right now with that story until somebody knocks you off the throne. I can't even imagine what that had to feel like. What bottom line issue is, do you go to the beach more now? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I, I'm not scared of the snow, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm a little bit more aware of my, maybe take not so many risks as I, well, that's, that's why you should just look out the window at the lodge, babe. That's my advice. Look out the window <laughs> from the lodge. So one of the things I like to do too, with everybody is just have a little bit of fun. So we're going to have a little TLC trivia time right now. You guys are playing for huge, huge prizes, huge yeah. prizes. Actually, right. you're playing, you're right. really playing, you're playing for nothing. So I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw some stuff out there and it's rapid fire. So whatever comes to mind, throw out an answer to me. Let's see what we come up with. All right. Who's your favorite superhero? Who's your favorite superhero? Batman. <laughs> He's nice. <not> superhero. <laughs> Chris, favorite superhero? Abominable snowman? Iron Man. Iron Man. Nice. Tony Stark, Iron Man, or the Iron Man from the comic books? Tony Stark. Okay. Fair enough. Avengers. Do you like to, do you like to text or talk more? Talk. Louise, text or talk more? Uh, talk. Good. Good. I, you're lying. It's a good answer, though. <laughs> All right. Godfather or Star Wars? Which one's better? Oh, Godfather. Godfather, yes. You're produce guys. I figured that was true. <laughs> <laughs> Cats or dogs? Dogs. Dogs. Yeah, you got that one right. Although I have both. Yeah. That's fair. All right, so now that we've gotten a little bit older and we've been playing in this business a long time, so this one this one will trip you up maybe a little bit. So, are you more at, are you more apt to ask for permission or beg for forgiveness? Ooh. Ask for um, permission. Because <laughs> your boss, because your boss is on the screen. Beg for <laughs> That's forgiveness. Right. That's right. And you've been married how many years? 
Who, me? Luis, how 20? many years you've been married? Oh, 23, oh, yeah. how many years you've been married? I've been married um, second time around for 11 years. Yes, yeah, so that's why that's why you've learned to beg for forgiveness. We have all done the same thing. I've been almost 30. It's beg for forgiveness, baby, over 30 now. So uh, one, one fast other question real quick. When I say this word, tell me what first thing that comes to your mind. Fruit. Figs. Um, pears. Good answer. You can't, there was really no wrong answer on that. It was just more to see how fast I could stump you. This has been great. You guys have been a ton of fun. And Louise, I want to, I want to end our time together with one final question to you um, yeah. to kind of sum all this up. If there's just one thing that you wanted people to know about Viva Tierra, what is it? That we're committed to our mission, our values, and, you know, preserving organic agriculture, pres pres helping farmers preserve their land, and while bringing quality, healthy food to people. Um, that's what Viva Tierra is all about, you know, Help, helping, helping our growers and helping our customers to bring value to both of the relationships. They're both important to us. Absolutely. I, I, I cannot think of a better way to end our time hanging out together. And I appreciate it. And that's organic to the core. And there it was. I was waiting for that. I was letting this <laughs> I had to say it at once. I yeah. love it. I love it. I can't thank you both enough um, for your friendship for, for one, but for taking the time to hang out with me a little bit on this crazy platform we're trying to put out there to everybody and just, you know, uplift conversation and change things. All right. And I, and I, I truly appreciate both of you. I appreciate you again, you. taking the time and being with us and uh, open invitation to come back anytime. You're always more than welcome. You know that. So thank you, th thank you both for, thank you, thank thank you both for having us. We thank you both for being well. here. All right, guys, take okay. care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Well, a huge, huge thank you uh, to Luis Acuna and Chris Ford from Viva Tierra for joining us today. That was super fun. Um, don't forget, uh, the video portion of this is available on our YouTube channel as well as tlc.organic. Uh, look for our advertising things we're doing on LinkedIn as well. Um, the audio version of this will be on every podcast channel in existence demand, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Cup Podcast, Stitcher, et cetera. Uh, please follow us. Please like us. Uh, please give us a good review if you like what we're doing. And if you don't, I'm sorry, give me a call and I'll figure out how to do it better. But we do appreciate you taking the time and hanging out with us a little bit and uh, go inspire people today. If there's any advice I can give you today, go inspire people. Thanks a lot. Talk soon.